Well, good morning, church. It is good to be here. My name is Paul Wilkerson. I'm still the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church in Mayfield, Kentucky. I'll be honest with you, I got a little... Okay, I'll, I'll take that applause. It's okay. You can still do that. I'll let you. I got a little nervous this morning. I'll be honest. I saw Tara and Brax here, and I thought, wow, this is the day. They didn't tell me about it. Wes is coming back and saying, good try, Paul. We're going to flip things around again. So, no, I'm just kidding. Tara, it is great. I don't see you anymore because these lights are incredibly bright, but it is good to have your family back with us this morning. All right, so... Good day. We get a chance to, to just really honor our graduates and get to see everyone with beautiful, smiling faces on this good Lord's Day. And so what a day it is. But if you have your Bible, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We are going to continue the series, The 12 Characteristics of a Healthy Church. We've been doing this series for now. I think this is the fourth week, maybe, that we've been doing this series, and we've been looking at a few different concepts. We started out in the first week of the series looking at biblical teaching and preaching. We really set up the, the fact that these words that we hold here in our Bible are actually the words of God, the breath of God. And if these are, in fact, the very words of God, they have many implications for our church and for our lives. Then we moved on to week two to talk about evangelism. We know how that brings a certain sense of phobia when we talk about evangelism, even evangelophobia. But yet, this is the primary means that God is using to bring people to himself. So we, we set up this, this initiative that God has blessed us so much so that we can proclaim his excellencies. And then last week, we did discipleship part one. And we really broke this up into two questions. And last week, we asked the question, are you a disciple? There's a big difference from identifying yourself as a Christian and actually being a biblical disciple. So if you missed any of those throughout the weeks, we have them on a podcast. You can go back and catch up because I really want this to be the identity of our church. As we look at these 12 fundamental characteristics, I want us to all be on the same page as we continue this ministry at First Baptist Church. And so today we're going to do the second part of our discipleship series, and it's going to be uh, not are you a disciple, but are you making disciples? That's the essential question we're looking at today, and hopefully you have a sermon guide that came in the bulletins, and you can kind of follow along and take notes. But the question we want to answer today is, are we making disciples of Christ? So with that being said, let me draw your attention to the text here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 this morning. Listen to the Word of God. It says this, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4 says, Hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." Pray with me, church, over the reading of the word. God, we are so thankful for your word, Lord. It's so challenging always as we look at this and ponder upon what this means for our lives. And I pray you would open up our minds, open up our hearts to receive your instruction this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm proposing this morning that the primary essence of what it means to be a disciple is that we make other disciples. So if we consider ourselves a disciple, if we could answer yes to the question last week, yes, Paul, I consider myself a disciple, then by necessary means that involves making other disciples. My printer really messed up today, and so it gave me like 50 pages of my notes. So don't get concerned of this stack of papers here. There's big words. So I want to set up this illustration. Have you ever wished that you were someone else? Has that been you? Or have you ever wished that you had different characteristics? I don't know about you, but I've, I've, you know, I've documented this well. I wanted to be a professional athlete. 
growing up. You might have heard the saying, white men can't jump. Although not always true, in my case, it was very fitting. And so to be a professional athlete, I knew I needed to jump higher. I needed to be taller. I needed to run faster. You know, all those things are pretty essential characteristics of being a professional athlete. But it didn't take long for me to realize that in my current state and what God has given me, those are not in my cards. But it didn't, you know, detain me from wishing that my characteristics were different so that I could achieve a different thing, i.e. professional athlete. This week, we had a conversation with some of our staff at lunch, and, and, I, and I recalled the time that I wish that I was a Navy SEAL. Anybody out there wish they were a special force out there? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I got so involved in reading the documentaries and and reading about these guys, and I walked away with thinking, these are some bad dudes. I think I want to be a bad dude. (laughs) You know, but I like the discipline and the, you know, the the physique and all the things that are necessary, you know, swimming, all those great things that you would need to do to be a Navy SEAL. I didn't possess those. So I wanted to be someone else so that I could achieve that thing. I even learned to play the guitar uh, back in the day, and I re- quickly realized that I couldn't sing very well. You know, like people tell you, oh, that's good. No, they never told me that. I was not a good singer. I knew I wasn't a good singer. Some people can't hear themselves that they're bad singers. I could actually hear that I was a bad singer, so if that lets you know how bad of a singer I actually was. So I thought, wow, if I could just learn to sing, I would love to be able to just serenade audiences and even serenade my wife. That would be fun, right? I wish I could sing. I wish I was given the gift of singing. But I stand here today with mediocre athletic skills, far from being a bad dude, and still can't carry a tune in a bucket. And I share this with you because being a disciple, there may be times that we wish we were someone else, because this would make discipleship so much easier. I think this would make the commands of God in our lives so much easier to fulfill. I think so many times we have feelings of inadequacy. I wish I knew more about the Bible so that I could better understand the concepts at a deeper level. I wish that I could be a better teacher. Or what about this? I wish that I was even given the gift of an extrovert. But thinking about even discipling someone else, like I don't know enough, I feel inadequate, and I just don't have those skills to be able to to explain or talk with others or teach others about the Word of God. And I think we have to wrestle with this because it doesn't matter what inadequacies that we feel like we have, we can't change the fact that we are still called to disciple others. Now, I don't want to waste time telling you what the Scripture says so plainly and so clearly this morning. Discipling others is a necessary and fundamental aspect of what it means to be a disciple. And we could stop there, but I'll give you at least a few verses, but it's not going to be the the thrust of the sermon this morning. But if you look at the Great Commission, everyone knows the Great Commission. Help Help me quote. It says, Go, therefore... And make disciples. Now, we usually use this text involved when it comes to missions. But really, this this text, go therefore, make disciples. The make disciples part is the only imperative in that entire text. Like Jesus' last words that he is giving to his followers while on earth is that they, this command to go and make other disciples. We can follow scripture out even in the New Testament in Colossians. We see Paul talking that he, he labors diligently to present believers mature in Christ. And the scripture that meant so much to me over the past few months is Ephesians 4, where he talks about the building up of the body of Christ into maturity. Justification is extremely important, and that's a huge concept in scripture. But also in scripture, we find this idea of sanctification. It's not meant for us to just be saved and justified and stop. Okay, follow the scripture out. We are called to help one another grow in maturity, in a process of discipleship. And this is not just for the church staff. This is for all of us, church. And I think scripture teaches this plainly. I want to share a quote with you. I think I have a picture of this. It says, the difficulty we modern Christians face is not misunderstanding the Bible, but persuading our untamed hearts to accept it's plain instructions. This is A.W. Tozer. If you, if you ever get a chance, I would encourage you to read A.W. Tozer. His words are so challenging and so fitting, even for a culture like ours today. 
The difficulty we modern Christians face is not misunderstanding the Bible, but persuading our untamed hearts to accept its plain instructions. And so that's my job this morning, church, is to, is to help us understand the plain instructions of what God is telling us today. It's not that we're going to really take so much time to help us begin to understand God's Word as, a, as opposed to really just being able to apply God's Word to our life. And so it really comes down to this question on your sheet I have here, not really a question. Discipleship is not a question of if, but who and how. I would love for our church to adopt this mentality that that discipleship is not an if, but who and how. And that's how we're going to divide it up today. If you go back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, I want to first begin to look at this, the who. Who is it talking about? Who do we as a church look to disciple? So if we come to this text, just to help us a little bit with context, Deuteronomy is the fifth and final book of the Pentateuch. This book was vitally important to the Hebrew people. And it worked as a sort of a review or a reiteration of all that had taken place in Israel's history. The first four books of the Bible, God's amazing plan of redemption, Deuteronomy is a way that that he's recapitulating or retelling what has happened in the first four chapters. The year is around 1406 BC, all right? Long time ago. We can't even really understand this, but in 1406, but to help you with, with context here, 40 years had passed since the miraculous exodus from Egypt. The children of Israel had now wandered in the desert for 40 years, right? And this new generation has come. The old generation paid their debt, and God's judgment on them had reached its end. And now this new generation sits at the edge of the promised land, gazing over the Jordan River, thinking about all that God had promised them, that they were soon, in in a few days to come, going to inherit this land that was given to them through Abraham in Genesis 12. So this is the scene that we pick up. In Deuteronomy 6, as Moses is commanding these people, and if you think about this, man, like, I just see the people of Israel, this new generation, they're just gazing over to the promised land, and as they're looking, it's so fitting that Moses says, hear, which in our translation would mean listen. So imagine this, their eyes are gazed here, and Moses is saying, listen, listen, let me tell you something so important. So God wanted Israel to know where they have been, where they currently are, but yet he wanted to prepare them for what would soon take place. This is an incredibly important text, but even in chapter 6, Moses sounds out an alert, which even makes it even more important. Due to the gravity and the elevated importance Moses gave to this passage, Israelites referred to this as the Shema. They memorized it. It became a daily prayer for the Israelites. Even today, the Jews recite this prayer daily, the Shema here, because of the gravity of what Moses is trying to say to the people. And so that's where we come in this text. And really, in this Shema, there's four movements. We're not going to go in depth in these four movements. We're really going to focus on the third movement. But we're going to tell the first two and then get to the third movement and how it relates to discipleship. But the first movement of the Shema starts in verse 4. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Essentially, he is worthy of it all. That was the very first sermon that I preached at First Baptist Church was I wanted to set up to you the glory of God and and to show us that he is worthy of everything. It's all about him. So we can move on to the second movement there. Verse 6, he says, these words shall be on your heart. Does that sound familiar, right? These are the very words of God. The first series or the first sermon in this series, 12 Characteristics, that was that second movement. So now as we follow the text out, the third movement comes in verse 7. Here's what he says. Verse 7 says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, I know I've said a lot of things in between the time I read it, so I don't know if you're you're catching the flow of what God is doing in this moment, but he's establishing a pattern. He establishes a pattern that God has ordained a way to carry out his teachings from generation to generation. To generation. If you're familiar with the way the, the text unfolds, God delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai the statutes and the rules and the commandments. And then in verse 1 here, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach to you. So if you follow this, Moses was on Mount Sinai, he received the instructions of God, and now he feels under compulsion by command of God to teach those to the Israelites. But then it doesn't stop there. What happens then? 
Then he says he's commanded the Israelites to teach the next generation. So God commanded it to Moses. Moses taught the Israelites, and now the Israelites are responsible to teach it to the next generation. Church, this is discipleship. This is a God-ordained plan that occurred over 3,000 years ago. And it's a concept that is so vitally important to the church and to God's glory, that if we take these words seriously, for generations, they can know about the things of God. We sit here today worshiping God, studying the scriptures because of the people who have gone before us that have taken this gospel and taken this word and diligently taught it to the next generation. So the who, church, the who do we disciple? I think this means, first of all, as we talk about this, it's our children and our grandchildren. Don't miss this primary structure of what God is establishing over 3,000 years ago. Raise your hand this morning if you are a parent or a grandparent. I got to see who we're... Wow, that's even more than I thought. You guys see that? Watch this again. Raise your hand if you're a parent or a grandparent. That's a lot. So right now, for a moment, I want to specifically speak to you. Now, if you're in here this morning and you're like, well, I don't have children and I don't have grandchildren, it's okay. I'm going to get to you in a minute. I'm not going to leave you out, I promise. But for a moment, I want to specifically speak to the ones that just raised their hand. And I want to move to the how. How are we to disciple our children and our grandchildren? The scripture is so challenging. Pick up with me in verse 7 here. Chapter 6, verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. I looked up this word just to figure out what this means, and it literally means to drag forward. And I looked up pictures of kind of the word picture that, this, that, this, that they, they came up with this word for, and it was really this, this stubborn mule. I don't know if you've ever had a stubborn mule. I've never personally had a stubborn mule. Some of you may have had. You see these pictures of a stubborn mule sitting down, and you see the old farmer just pulling with all of his might to get this stubborn mule to move. This is the word that they're using here to describe how we are to teach our children. It's this struggle. It's this pulling forward of our kids into the things of God. It means to induce by persuasion. So as you're looking at the way that you teach your children, does this describe the way we as disciples are training up our children? Are we laboring to pull them and to drag them into the things of God and into his scriptures? And he doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says, talk of them. Talk of them. This is a verbal command. The word literally means to emit a sound. You know, I think what happens is a lot of times when we think about discipleship, we see it as modeling. Modeling is a very good thing, and I encourage you parents and grandparents, model the scriptures. Model the heart of God in your character. That's necessary. But if you follow the scripture, literally, it means to verbally emit a sound. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them. Verbally teach the scriptures to your children and your grandchildren. That's the, that's the thrust of what these words are trying to tell us. And he even goes on to give even more practical instructions. He says, talk of them when, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Talk of them when you're, when you're, when you're in your home, when there's downtime in your home, when you, when you drive in your car, when you go to bed at nights, when you wake up in the mornings, talk, verbally teach these things to your children. Is that us, church? Are we verbally, diligently teaching these things to our children on a weekly, daily basis? I want to be honest, I've told several people that this, this, this week, that this scripture has struck me this week. I've been involved in several meetings throughout the week, and I've always read this scripture because I, I can't get away from it. You can even ask my wife and my children. Like, this scripture is just, it's convicted me this week, seeing the urgency that's involved in this text, and then looking in our life and thinking, does that describe me as a parent? Am I diligently pulling my children and verbally teaching them the scriptures? Like in Dubai, it was kind of easy because we homeschooled, and we were at home all day, and our children were there all day. But now as we're getting back into this life and our kids are going to school and, and we're going to work, it becomes a little more difficult and the patterns of our life are not the same. And so I'm starting to think even after a month, I've got to make some changes 
in my family to make sure that my life looks like the scripture that I'm reading. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not okay with just participating in this culture, simply modeling the things of God. And of course, we, we talk about things. We, we talk about God. We talk about the scriptures. But do I have intentional plans set up to teach these things to my children? And I think one of, the, one of the things that comes down to it is like we don't feel like we have the time for this. Paul, how am I supposed to diligently teach verbally the instructions to my children? If you think about it like this, this might be very obvious, but God set up the world with a 24-hour time frame, and he's established our bodies so that we can be awake for about 16 of those hours. If he's, a, if he's ordained this process of discipleship, and he's created the world to be on the time frame in our bodies that they're in such a way, they're not mutually exclusive. They can work together. So if you think about it, it's not necessarily that, that the plan can't work. It comes down to it, are we making the time for that plan to work in our lives? Are you using the time that God has given you to be obedient to his plan and his pattern? I want to say this a couple of times in this next sentence here. In our culture today, you will have to intentionally say no to cultural expectations in order to create space to be obedient to the scriptures. Think about that, church. I'm going to say this one more time. In our culture today, you will have to intentionally say no to cultural expectations in order to create space to be obedient to scripture. Church, if we are not careful, work and extracurricular activities will dominate our life. If you do not intentionally place boundaries around your family, to protect your time, we will not be able to be obedient to what the Scripture is teaching us. I think we invest so much time and our energy into our children's extracurricular activities, sports, academics, hobbies. We invest so much time in our jobs. And I look back and I look at the culture, and I'm even looking at my own life, and I'm thinking how tragic it is that we have wasted so much precious time diligently training them to succeed at the wrong game. Let this be a divine reminder as Moses was reminding the people to say, here, listen. Church, that's what I'm calling us to this morning, to hear, listen. Direct your attention back to the scriptures. Observe your life. Let this scripture convict us and challenge us to begin to change how we operate in our families. I think on your sheet, I have a so that test. You may not understand what this means, and it may not make as much sense to you as it does in my mind, and that's going to be just the theme of my time here, so I'm just going to throw that out there, okay? There's things that make sense in my mind that, you know, to others, it's kind of confusing. But in my mind, this makes so much sense, and we talk about it often in our family. We give it the so that test. The so that test, you can continue whatever you put in that first blank. You just ask, so that. Then you put something else there, and then you say, okay, so that. So that, so you get kind of to the end of it, and you think, okay, what is the essence of this thing that we started with, all right? We can do, you can do any number of things, but as we're talking about parents and kids, uh, one of the things that we see in our culture, and even for sure in the culture that we just came from, was we want our kids to be really good at academics, okay? So we can put that in the, in the blank there. I want my kids to be really good at school, really make good grades. So that, let's follow that out so that they can get good grades and succeed in school. Everybody with me? That's a good thing, right? It's not a bad thing yet. Let's follow that out so that maybe they can get a good grade on the ACT, so that they can get into college, maybe even really stress academics so that they can get a scholarship. So that, well, so that they can not have student loans, okay? So that they can get a good job when they graduate so that they can have success and live a comfortable life. I don't know if you want to stop there. You can play this game out on your own. You carry this so that, and you get to this end point. Like, yes, we want our family to, to live a comfortable, successful life. But church, if that's what we're spending all of our time diligently investing into our children, that end goal there, I think it, it just misses the thrust of what Scripture is teaching us. That's not the end goal of our children's life is so that they live comfortable, healthy, successful lives in our culture. The scripture calls more for us as parents. God wants more from our lives. He wants us to be obedient followers of him, proclaiming his kingdom throughout the world. 
That scripture's call in our life. So I hope we're seeing this. So those so that's follow those out to make sure that that go is where we want to end. And it, you can even use reverse psychology. Then it start at the end. Begin with the end in mind. And then figure out how you can change the actions on the front end to create this goal. So what do we really want for our children? Establish that go in your family and then work backwards to figure out how you can, as parents, achieve that go. And please hear me, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with good grades. So kids, if you're out there right now, don't go home and tell your parents, I told you, it's not important that we make good grades. That is not what I'm saying, okay? On the record, it's not what I'm saying. All right. I think it's really neat to see and just ask your kids sometimes. And we did this this week. Ask your kids, what do you value? Not what they value. Ask your kids what they see in you that you value. What would they say that you prioritize? If you want a good humbling exercise this afternoon, go home and ask your kids that. Kids are honest. They just tell you. And it's just a good practice for us to continue to bring our minds back to. So my challenge to you, for the ones that raised your hand, grandparents and, 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 and parents, raise your hand again. Where are we at? Okay, I just want to see that. There's just so many. Okay. Comes over number three there on your, on your sheet. My challenge would, would be to you is to create an intentional plan to verbally teach the scriptures to your family. Talking about practical, this series is a very practical series, and I want to give a practical plea to you this morning is to, to create an intentional plan to verbally teach the scriptures to your family. Work with your family to even create this plan. Because if we don't create this intentional plan to make this a priority, church, it's never going to happen. So work to create this plan, and I gave you space there to do this. All right, and then as we move on to the fourth movement, he says these words, you shall bind them on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house. I have a few pictures here. This is just intriguing to me. Nothing really about discipleship in this moment, but they used to wear these boxes on their head. This is an ancient Jew, right? And he would have this box on his head and it would actually have the Shema inside of it. So when he said, you shall bind them between or as frontlets between your eyes, literally meant they put it between their eyes. And then the next picture shows they should bind them to your arm. They would strap this leather strap around their arm with the inscriptions of this text on it. They took these words literal. And even today, these are modern pictures of the Jew at the Wailing Wall with these scriptures attached to his arms. We can go on to the next picture now or whatever we're going to. But discipleship requires us to be a people whose world revolves around the Word of God, whose conscious thoughts are shaped by Scripture. I hope you hear the weight of this text. And that's what my goal is in this part. For those parents and grandparents, feel the weight of what God is telling us through his word. Well, you might be here and think, well, I don't have children, Paul. You spent a lot of time and you have not talked to me yet. Well, now is your time. So if you've got a Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Even if you have kids and grandkids, this also applies for you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says this. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Catch that? What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will, who will be able to teach others also. Do you see any similarities between what Moses is instructing to the people and what Paul is instructing to Timothy here? Paul received from God, and he taught these to Timothy, and he's commanded Timothy to teach them to a faithful man who will then be able to teach that to someone else. It's the process of discipleship. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God has ordained a method for carrying on his ways and his scriptures from generation to generation. To generation. And what's unique about this passage, there's no mention of parents and children. In the New Testament, we find this general call and this general plea of Paul to look at our lives and to think like, okay, we, that we need to find and discover faithful men or women in our lives that we can teach the scriptures to, who are able to teach those to others and thus spread the scriptures and the glory of God over our communities. 
So the who. Who in your life, who could you entrust this word to? Do you have someone that you know that would be a good candidate to entrust these scriptures with so that they could then begin to teach that to someone else? Are there friends? Are there, are there co-workers? Are there extended family members that you have? Think through these things. Who is this who that you're thinking about? And then think about how. How. Okay, I've discovered this person. Okay, now what do I do? And that's always the problem. You might think like, Paul, yes, okay, you're convincing me it's my road to disciple someone else. I see Scripture's pattern. I see its flow. But what do I say? I don't don't know what to do. I, I feel inadequate. I don't have the answers to their questions. This is a very intimidating thing, Paul, that you're asking me to do. And I realize that. There are barriers that's going to come up between you and the obedience to the Scripture. Show this statistic on the screen. Barna Research did, did a study, and they asked this question, please select which item comes closest to describing why you are not discipling another person currently. And the number one answer, 37% was, I don't think I'm qualified or equipped. I don't feel like I'm qualified or equipped is the main reason why we are not discipling one another inside the church. And I feel like for years, what would happen was I would stand on this stage or stand in the youth room and I would command, like the, the scriptures plead to, to encourage us and to entice us to disciple others. But then I didn't come back and follow that with a really intentional equipping on how to do that work. And so this began to really become a burden on our lives. And this is the primary work that we have done for the last two years, that we saw these problems, we saw the is- these issues The company that we worked with saw the same issues, and they hired us to come and say, okay, think through this. If we were going to disciple the church, how to disciple others, what would you tell them? And so we created a year-long program that can be rolled out in the churches that would train them on the scriptures, to teach them the things of God, and to equip them with the necessary things that they need to teach these things to someone else. One of the main reasons that I took this position, you may not know this, but was the opportunity that I saw to be able to take this curriculum and this, these things that we were working through and developing to bring them to a church and lead a church to be faithful to this work of discipleship. It's incredible the power that can happen if we were to take this serious. If we were as a church to gather around this idea of discipleship, that we would be obedient to this scripture. Church, the sky is the limit. So please hear my heart. I'm passionate about discipleship. You will hear this over and over and over again. When they hired me, the first meeting that I had with them, they kind of asked me, what is my vision for the church? And and discipleship was on that short list. Church, I want our church to be a church of discipleship. I want us to be a center for discipleship so that the people of this body feel equipped and prepared to do the work that the scripture is teaching them to do. And I want to make that happen for you guys. And so in January which I know is a long time away, but if you didn't know this, we don't have a building right now. So we're hoping for sure to be in this uh, in the fall or the winter, but by January, starting the new semester, I want to take some time to gather our church to walk through this year-long curriculum and this program so that at the end of the year, that there can no one in our body stand up and say, I don't think I'm qualified or equipped. If you commit to this, I promise you by the end of that, you will be qualified and you will be equipped. So that takes care of 37% of the people who feel like that they don't feel adequate to do this work. If you go down the statistic, it says, no one has suggested it or asked me to. That's just 24%. Guess what? I'm suggesting this to you, and I'm asking you. Well, that's 24%. Wow, that's good. That was easy. All right. 22% says, I just haven't thought about it. Work with me on this. Think about it. Okay, I hope you had a chance to think about it. So that carries 22%. 3%, I had a bad experience in the past. 3% of the people are always going to have a bad experience. Right? You know those 3% of the people. And then the 14% is just other. I don't know how to help the others. But I feel pretty confident that I can help 83% of you all today. So I want us to be thinking about these things. As we, as we go to this illustration that we've been using over the last few weeks and closing, and Paul, if you want to go ahead and, and be coming up, we, we've, we begin to look at this idea of a museum ship versus a battleship. Who do we want to be 
as a church. We, we talked about the USS Iowa, how it was mighty in battle and did so many great things, but eventually it was converted to a museum ship that's open on the weekends for people to visit. Who do we want to be? Do we want to be a battleship or do we want to be a museum ship? And when it comes to discipleship, I want you to look at these things. What would it look like if our church was a museum ship? Sadly, I think it's going to look as we see in Scripture. Follow this out. In 1406, when we pick up our passage, in 1406, Moses is commanding these things to the people. Diligently teach your children. Diligently teach the next generation. This generation, in fact, did those things. They went to the promised land. They inherited the promised land. They were faithful to God. But in Judges chapter 2, literally less than 100 years after our text. Think about this. Less than 100 years after our text, these words were recorded in Judges chapter 2, verses 8. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountains of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. Listen to this. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the bells. And they abandoned the Lord their God, their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. Church, if we adopt a museum ship mentality and we are not faithful to this command to diligently teach these to the next generation, this is the result, church. This is what happens. We are quick to run to the ways of the world. But what if, church, what if we were faithful to the scriptures? What if First Baptist Church Mayfield adopted a battleship mentality when it came to discipleship? What if? I'm not going to share all these numbers with you, but I started putting things on paper this week. What if? What if we had 100 people commit to learning how to disciple others? If you follow these statistics out, the numbers are incredible. I'm not going to go over all these numbers, but just know that the result of this in four to five years is these buildings that we have here cannot hold the people that would be fully equipped and discipled and ready to disciple others. Who do we want to be, church? Do we want to be this museum ship and just go through the motions? Or do we want to commit to the things of God and commit to discipleship and see our communities changed? It's up to us, church. We're the ones who get to decide this. So it is my plea and my prayer that this church adopts that. And as we see Revelation 7, come to fruition one day that thousands are standing before the throne from, na- from the nations, mature in Christ, worshiping and declaring that Jesus is Lord. That, that's the result of churches who are serious about the call of discipleship on their lives. So church, it's my prayer that we find our who and that we develop our how and that we live as true disciples of Christ, making other disciples.